good to be talking to the folks that are uh, on our uh, website, and so uh, good to see all of y'all. We're going to be starting something new. The first thing I'd like to do is say uh, we're going to be actually using an app. You don't have to have the app, but it's good to have the app. How about that? It's good to have the app. Uh, if you have a smartphone, and almost everybody's got one nowadays, or, or a tablet, or uh, anything, any uh, smart electronic device, we can get the app on it. So uh, Jen is taking names of the people that are interested in getting the app. Also, after church tonight, uh, Robbie and Jen will be available to help anybody. Huh? And Candice. Candice Candace and Robbie will be, there she is, there's Candice, thank you very much. Uh, they will be available to help folks get the app on their phone. Um, because this is sort of an interactive kind of uh, Bible study. It's certainly uh, not exactly what I'm used to. And, and it's interactive in more ways than one. You're going to have an app if, if you choose to participate in that. We're going to have videos that we're going to watch. And it's also interactive in the sense that it doesn't work if I just get up here and talk. There are going to be questions. And it, the thing is designed... For you guys to participate it's designed for you guys to be involved in it too it's a interactive two-way street kind of thing so if you guys don't participate it's not going to take me long to get through because a lot of this is based on you guys answering questions and, and us discussing things together discussing things together <clears throat> uh, the name of this series is listen and listen is a 40-week series. This will be the introduction tonight, but as I understand it, this Listen series goes all the way through the Bible, beginning in passages in Genesis and ending in passages in Revelation. So it's a 40-week series. And something else that's very unique about this thing that we're all going to be doing together is literally every age group in the church is going to be doing this together. Now, it'll be age-appropriate for each age group, but the scriptures that we look at and the ideas that we talk about and the lessons that we learn, every age group in the, group, in the church. So you can talk to this, talk about this with your kids, or you can talk about this with your grandkids, something I've never actually participated in anything like it before. So I, I'm really excited. Um, <clears throat> so the name of the thing is listen listen and and so i was thinking about scriptures that talk about listening to the lord and and the first thing that i thought of and it's going to be a very familiar scripture to a lot of you is from deuteronomy it's deuteronomy 6 4 you think you can get that on the screen deuteronomy 6 4 hear o israel the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Now, that's a very interesting verse of Scripture because it's very central to every devout Jew. Every devout Jew says this verse of Scripture when they open their eyes in the morning and before they go to sleep at night and they intend for it to be the last words that they breathe. They want it to be the last thing they say. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And if we think about the context in which this was written, this was written to the people after they've left all of the idolatry and the many gods, the polytheism of Egypt, and they're about to go into the land of Canaan where there are many, many gods and many distractions and many things seeking their attention, and God wants them to listen and know that there's one, that there's one. And so the name for this prayer in Hebrew is the Shema prayer, the Shema prayer. And that's because that word translated here in English is the Hebrew word Shema. Now, in some modern translations, it's translated listen. You can find that. I went to my Bible Hub 
app and I saw 20 different translations and some of them say hear O Israel and some of them say listen O Israel but all of those miss the point of what is meant by the Hebrew word Shema it's one of those Hebrew words that means a little more than some of our English words uh, I went to school with some Jewish folks when I was in dental school and they would say shalom to each other and I said well what does that mean and they said well shalom means hello goodbye and peace peace when we're to pray for the peace of Israel we're praying for the shalom of Israel but that word here that word Shema in Hebrew what it literally means, what it actually means, what it means to every one of those Jewish people that pray it the moment they wake up and the moment before they go to sleep and the moment before they pass into eternity, Shema means hear, listen, and obey. Hear, listen, and obey. And so I just think it's really fitting that the name of this series that we're going to begin is the listen series because that's what God wants us to do he wants us to listen like the word hear listen and obey you know you can hear things and not listen at all you ever you ever experience that you ever had that experience maybe with a with a child they, they hear the words but they're not listening or the experience with a husband or a wife. <clears throat> so listening is a step above hearing, isn't it? But obeying is a step further. And that's what God calls us to do. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So we're about to begin the listen series where we're going to learn to listen to the word together. Listen to the word together. So we come together to study the Word of God. That's what we do. That's one of the things that we do as a church. We come together to study the Word of God. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, 1. It sounds a lot like Genesis 1, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And wait a minute, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. If you read on down in that chapter, it says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us. So we come together to study the written Word. But the written Word is a living Word word and another name for Jesus is the word so when we study the word Jesus is in the word and the word is in Jesus so we're going to be studying the word and we're going to try to learn to listen together to this living God breathed word of God Has anybody here ever experienced a time when you were reading the scripture and God spoke to you through his word that it just jumped out at you and it spoke to you through his word? It happens to me more and more a lot lately when he speaks to me through his word. A lot of times something that I have read many, many times, sometimes something that I have memorized and I know it and I'll read it again and he'll say something new. He'll say something new. <clears throat> Recently, well, this Sunday morning, the, the gentleman that was, was speaking put a passage of scripture up on the screen. It was Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And uh, that verse says, if I remember correctly, it says, go into all the world 
There it is. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe, to obey all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, every time I ever read that in the past, I, just to make my English grammar a little better in my head, I put an S on the end of that. Lo, I'm with you always. But this Sunday, for the first time ever, as I read that, it, it spoke into my heart something I had all, always missed. And maybe you always got it, but it was new for me. See, it says all way because he's with us all the way. He's with us all the way. And so, as we read scripture... He speaks into our lives. And we want to make sure we learn to listen as he speaks into our life. So what about y'all? Have y'all ever experienced a time when you were reading the word, reading the Bible, and God speaks to you through the word? Now somebody got to talk. I can't, somebody, this is your turn. Yeah. The, the, the context of that is the Apostle Paul was praying to be delivered from the thorn in the flesh. And he said, Three times I prayed that I could be delivered from this thorn in the flesh. And we don't even know exactly what it is. And God said, My grace is sufficient for you because in my weakness, in your weakness, yeah. So, he will speak to us through his word. Does he speak to everybody? No. He doesn't speak to everybody. Everybody's not listening. Everybody's not listening. But we want to make sure we're listening. You can only understand the word through the light of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. I, I've told this story before in my Sunday school class. I don't know if I've shared it with the church or not, but... About a decade ago, I was watching a news program and they were interviewing a man who was the dean of the seminary, the divinity school at Harvard University. And he was an expert in biblical languages. He was an expert in the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek. And he was one of the greatest experts in the world. And he knew it backwards and forwards. And he didn't believe a word of it. See, it didn't speak to him. But God wants to speak to us and he will speak to us if we listen. If we listen. My phone keeps going dark and I have to keep calling my out back up. Would you uh, go ahead and play the video for everybody? For thousands of years, Christians have described their faith as a journey. It's an image Jesus returned to again and again, calling his disciples to follow him 
describing the wide and the narrow ways. That image of traveling a path so captured early Christians that the first believers called themselves people of the way. They saw themselves as a community of followers on a journey together. While our lives and our worship may seem so distant from those first believers, we are still traveling that same path. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus' first followers found their way by gathering together, opening their hearts in prayer, and listening as the Holy Spirit called them forward into the world. It was the same Holy Spirit who calls us today. Just after Jesus' resurrection, he came across two of his followers walking along an ancient road toward a small town called Emmaus. Something prevented them from recognizing who he was, even as they were discussing the devastating news of his death just a few days before in Jerusalem. It's a moving scene, but what Jesus does is even more moving. He walks with them, and he begins to explain to them from all of the scriptures, from the beginning of Genesis and on through the prophets, how this death and resurrection had all been predicted. Could you imagine a small group discussion with the resurrected Jesus? Their path eventually led them into a home for the night and around a table for the evening's meal. As Jesus took the bread, blessing it and breaking it, they suddenly realized who he was. Scripture tells us that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. They were with Jesus. Jesus had been teaching them scripture. But following Jesus didn't come to an end that night around that table. Their journey was really just beginning. Jesus had opened their eyes to the truth, to a new reality. They were now on an entirely new path. The Christian faith is not a card we carry. It's not just some status we achieve or a box we check on a form. The Christian faith is always a journey. We are still people of the way. And like those disciples traveling that day with Jesus, we are never on that road alone. As our eyes are opened, we too discover a new way, a community, and the words of God calling us forward. And like those disciples on the road that day with Jesus, our most primary task is to listen. We are always listening. And as we listen, this story, the biblical story, comes alive. God has been walking with his people from the very beginning, from that first morning in the garden with Adam and Eve, to the decades of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, to Jesus' days with his disciples on rocky Galilean shores, and still, as the Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts. As the psalmist would express it, your word is a lamp to guide my feet, a light for my path. The Bible illuminates our way and guides us on this journey. But listening is hard. Listening requires patience. It requires attention. It requires humility. But if we are willing to listen, if we are willing to humble ourselves and enter into this journey, all eternity lay before us. Jesus Christ goes before us. His kingdom is breaking in all around us. Narrow is his path, but those who are willing to follow find on it a journey of peace and hope and joy and community. We find a new community of brothers and sisters with us on this way. But it all begins with a simple question. Will you listen? They talk a lot in this about listening as a community, listening together, listening as a community of believers. Um, we're, we're all on the way. 
We're all on the journey. The early Christians called it the way. You know where that came from, don't you? Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the way. And so we're all traveling on the way. And we all travel alone, but we all travel together. And so it's a community. And so the, the idea behind this is so we come together and we listen as a community. Now, the app also has daily devotions, and uh, I think there are four or five daily devotions for each week, and I'm going to study those. I encourage y'all to study those. I encourage y'all to, to, to look at what we're going to be talking about because there are a lot of those interactive questions. The first question is, what are we looking forward to about our listen journey together? I think we'll learn things together that we won't learn apart. Um, the scripture says not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. And so that's a command. We're commanded to come together. And we're not commanded to come together because it's a burden. We're commanded to come together because it's a help. It's a help. So we're going to come together and we're going to be on this journey together. And we're going to listen together. What's different about the Bible from other books? There are lots of good books out there. Uh, the pastor had a great big library full of good books. It's, it's a lot smaller now because um, Phyllis had uh, family members come and take those books. And she had other people in the ministry and other missionaries. People went through those and took books that might be helpful to them and might be meaningful to them. So he had a library full of good stuff. But what's different between those books and the Bible? Why is the Bible unique? It's alive. It's alive. Uh, I think it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God breathed. God breathed. Now, <clears throat> let's go back for just a second to the book of Genesis. To where God created Adam. It says he formed him from the clay of the ground. And what did he do to bring him to life? He breathed into him. Adam was breathed to life. And all scripture is what? It's God. It's God breathed. It's alive. It's alive. And so the difference between the scripture and all those other books, and there's plenty of good books out there. There's a lot of them that aren't so good, right? But there are good ones out there. But only the scripture is alive. And it's still just as relevant as it was 3,000 years ago when David wrote the Psalms. 2,000 years ago when the Gospels were written and the New Testament was written. You know, sometimes I'll pull out a book that was a favorite of mine a while back, and I'll read it, and it's kind of out of fashion. Or I don't like it as much now as I did. Maybe some of the lessons in it didn't endure. But the Bible's alive. And that's what makes it different. It's alive. And because it's alive, the Holy Spirit can use that living word to work in us. To change us. So every time we gather, we're going to watch a video that goes into the sessions Bible passage. And we're going to go a little bit further 
down this journey together. The Bible's central to our lives as believers. I said that Jesus was the Word incarnate. God's in the Word. The Word is in God. We don't understand anything about God apart from the Word. He's revealed to us in the Word. And so it's absolutely central to us. And and so I was thinking about some of the ways that God's Word is so vital, so central to us. One thing is it's our, it's God's love letter to us. In this great big universe, how are you going to find God on your own? You can't find God. He has to find you. It's what's like the Chuck Norris joke. You don't find Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris finds you. I don't really believe that, but I do know that we couldn't find him. He had to find us. And he's spoken to us through his word. And the word is his love letter to us. And if you will read it, Jesus goes from Genesis chapter 1 to the end of Revelation. He's in the whole thing. He's in the whole thing. He's pictured in the whole thing. In types and shadows and symbols in the Old Testament and literally coming to life in the New Testament, it's God's love letter to us. But it's more than that. It's also God's instruction manual for life. I think we're beginning to see what a mess the world gets in when they begin to disregard the instructions. It gets in the ditch pretty quick. I had a a friend in college, he said the secret to driving was to keep in the smooth part of the road and stay out of the ditches, well, you get in the ditch pretty quick if you disregard the instruction. So the Bible is central to our lives. It's God's love letter. It's an instruction manual for life and peace. And finally, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. The scripture says... uh, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? There's no parachute, no jumping off point, no plan B, no alternative, no other way. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And so if we think about all the things his word gives us, it gives us wisdom. James in his little book says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. It's the only source of wisdom. Uh, In Proverbs it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the Bible is our source for wisdom. The Bible is our source for healing See, when we go to the scripture, it heals our spirit, it heals our mind, it even heals our body. In the garden, they drank in the garden and they ate of the trees in the garden and they were refreshed and replenished, but the scripture is the wellspring of life for us today, so it's our wisdom, it's our healing. It's our comfort in difficulty. The psalmist says, take me to the rock that is higher than I. You ever been in a place where you needed to go to the rock that was higher than you? Well, you'll find that in the scripture. You'll find that in the Bible. And really, the scripture is our only source for encouragement Because if you don't know how all this ends, it's easy to get discouraged with the way the world is and the way things appear to be going. And so apart from Scripture, 
there's not any encouragement. But in Scripture, there is. In Scripture, there is. He says, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Uh, Our scripture is in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. It's what they were talking about on the video. You may be able to pull it up on the app. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. I'll just read it. Now, this is the day that Jesus was resurrected. I'll read it in the NIV, beginning in verse 13. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened, and they talked and discussed these things. And Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Verse 25, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time they were entering Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Since the night is with us, it's getting late. Stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour... They were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered gathered with them who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. So the Bible story about the road to Emmaus two followers and it's right after the resurrection but they're heading to the house looks like they've sort of given up they're kind of bewildered they've heard that Jesus isn't in the tomb but they're just tired and they're just going home and They encounter Jesus on the road, and he opens their eyes. And the scriptures that they had known all their life, suddenly, they understand. And then finally, their eyes are opened, 
and they see who Jesus really is and that he's there. So do you think there are people today who can read the scriptures and miss the whole point? So what's the difference in the people that miss the whole point and the people who see the truth? What's the difference? Jesus said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. You got to be listening. You got to want to know the truth. <clears throat> and so they had a plan about what they thought Jesus was supposed to do. They had this preconceived notion, okay, here's what he's going to do. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to work miracles, and then he's going to do things our way, and it's going to work out just the way we think it ought to work out. And it didn't work out exactly that way. It worked out real different. Have you ever had a dream or a plan, and it turned out differently than you expected or maybe God made it turn out differently than you expected. I, very, I bet very few people plan on spending their life in Nepal. I mean, it just doesn't come up every day in Butler, Alabama. Probably was a big surprise. Or maybe you started out with one life plan only to realize somewhere along the way, well, that's not what I thought it was going to be. And I need to change directions. I need a new plan. Or maybe you got just what you hoped for, just what you planned for, just what you worked for, and it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. That's what it, the advertising on TV, that's what it's all about. If you'll just buy this, oh, if you'll just buy it, you'll just be satisfied finally and forever. If you'll just get this kind of whatever, this, this kind of car, this pair of shoes, this what, whatever it is they're selling today, whatever it is you're looking for, and you buy it, and guess what? How long did it keep you satisfied? Not very long. Not very long. <clears throat> Jesus reacts to what they had to say. Luke 24, verses 25 and 26. Jesus reacts to their, their point of view. Can you pull that up? Luke 24, 25 and 6. What did he say? O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26. Ought not Christ to have to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? So, is it surprising that Jesus is upset with them for missing the point? Yeah, I know he's got to get frustrated with me. I get frustrated with me, and I'm not even him. What now?
there's a southern gospel song. It's by a group called The Steels, and it's about the road to Emmaus. And look it up on YouTube if you have, ch have a chance, especially if you like southern gospel music. But in this song, they say, uh, Oh, to have the chance like they did to listen to him teach the word. But I have the spirit living within me. So we don't actually have to walk down the road with Jesus to Emmaus. He said, it's good if I go away because I'll send another comforter. And he opens our eyes and our hearts to the scripture. So let's come together as we go through this series and let's be prayed up. Let's be ready and let's say, Lord, show us what you want us to see. Take us where you want us to go. Because I have a feeling if we don't do that, we're not going to see it and we're not going to get there. But if we listen, he's speaking. He's speaking. Do any of you have anything that you're hoping to hear from God while we're doing this listen journey? Are any of y'all looking to hear an answer right now? Is there a question that anybody has and they're looking for God to answer it? I mean, I think if we think about it, we all do, right? God, what about my lost loved one? Lord, what's your will for us as a church? Lord, what do you want us to do as we seek a pastor? What do you want us to do to get ready? So, I hope that I get some wisdom from him about these things in my own life and in all of our lives together. Good. Um, <clears throat> go to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I asked a little while ago what makes the Word of God different from every other book. Here it is. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13. 
neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened up unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So we said some of those things. God's word is alive. God's word is powerful. Paul knew what a two-edged sword looked like. Because that's the sword that the Romans carried with them. He probably saw people lost. He saw probably saw people lose their lives to those Roman two-edged swords. And he said it's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Think about this. It says cutting between soul and spirit. Between soul and spirit. You know, I. I've heard it explained to me that we're made in the image of God. God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are three parts to us, body, soul, and spirit. And I can kind of understand what body is. I can see that. And I kind of have an idea about soul and spirit. But in my head, those are kind of all wrapped up. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around what's the difference between those and I've heard some people try to explain it to me and I don't know if the explanation wasn't very good or I wasn't very smart but I still couldn't quite figure out what the difference was between soul and spirit but the word of God knows the difference And if we'll get that into our lives, it'll cut away everything in the way. Everything in the way. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. If you can read scripture without falling under conviction, I don't see how. Because it's like a mirror. You ever seen one of those magnifying mirrors, you know, that makes everything look bigger? See it sharper and in more clear detail? That's the way it is when I read the scripture. I, I can't get very far through the Sermon on the Mount without realizing how miserably I fail. Had a lot of this stuff. But he's working on me. And he works on me with the Spirit through his word. With the Spirit through his word. Just a second. Second Timothy three fourteen through sixteen. Second Timothy three fourteen through well three fourteen through seventeen. Second Timothy three beginning in fourteen. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul is writing to Timothy. I guess I'll do it in a modern translation. It says, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they're true, for you know and can trust those who taught you. Verse 15, You've been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, and here it is. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what is right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So, Scripture's alive 
and it's God breathed and he uses it to teach us what's true what did Pilate say to Jesus what is truth he didn't know truth was standing right there we'll never know the truth unless we get it from scripture that's the only place we're going to learn it and so as we go through this study together 40 Wednesday nights beginning in Revelation and going all the way through Genesis we're going to listen and we're going to seek the truth and we're going to try to learn it. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the book of James a minute ago. It's so little and short and so full of truth. But one of the things James says is let's not just be hearers of the word, but let's be doers. Because if we hear and we don't do, well, James says, can that kind of faith save you? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word to change lives. Thank you for the power of your word to change me. And Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us that we would come away listening to your word and not just listening, but be changed. Not just be hearers of your word, but be doers also. In Jesus' name, amen.